welcome to Topper Talk, your number one Western Kentucky Athletics podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Moffitt, and I'm joined by co-host Tyler Bailey. Hilltopper Nation, whether it's happening on the hill or on the road, grab those red towels, stand up and cheer, because it's up next on Topper Talk. All right, welcome back, and thank you for downloading and listening to another episode of the Topper Talk podcast. As always, follow us on all those social media accounts. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Topper underscore talk. Uh, We're also on YouTube at Topper Talk podcast, and we're on Facebook at Topper Talk. Um, As always, this podcast is sponsored by the Fireman Moving Company. Uh, The Fireman Moving Company is the official moving company of WKU Athletics. Not only can they be trusted to move all the coaches in and out of Western, but they can move you anywhere nationwide. The Fireman Moving Company is owned and operated by Fireman and is founded by WKU alumni. If you're looking to move sometime soon, give them a call at 270-791-1755 and get yourself a free quote. And like always, I promise you it will be the best thing uh, that you do, you know, to make your life easier. If you do have moving needs, like I always say, near, near or far, big or small, you know, whatever you're doing, just let them make your life a lot easier. If you're unsure about it, call them and get a free quote. I promise you it'll be worth your time. Um, I've got Tyler here with me, man. We've got a, a a fun episode, a big long episode to jump into. You ready to get into it? Oh yeah, man. Uh, the recap's not going to be near as fun, but the preview should be uh, should be well worth it. And the red towel wrap up is going to be awesome. Yeah, like you said, the red towel wrap up is going to be awesome. We've got a lot to cover. Uh, that red towel wrap up does catch us up with all the athletics we've missed since we last recorded. And as always, it is now brought to you by Trent Betting Company. So let's get a word from Trent. Before we hop in, don't forget your headboards, pillows, and your sheets. We got everything you need for a good night's sleep. Number one on the same check, best of Bowling Green. All right, all right, all right. Hey! Twins, fool, queen, and king, mattresses for anything. Come and pick it out, and we can bring it to your house. Have you sleep real good before the weekend's out? Trim bed, trim bed, trim bed, trim bed. It's just like, it's just like. Mattress store. Hey, hey. God, I love that commercial. Tyler, red towel wrap up. I'm sorry. That song is a banger, though. It slaps. Uh, all right. So, red towel wrap up. Uh, women's golf finished second in the Reynolds Lake Okani Invitational. Katie Craig fin- uh, finished third. Addie Westbrook tied for fourth. Sarah Ar- Arnold tied for 15th. Avery Klein tied for 23, Savannah Howell tied for 41st, and Sydney Hackett tied for 59th. Yeah, the women's golf team, you know, we talked about when we, um, you know, we talked about their schedule when it got released for the spring that we hoped that they would pick up right where they left off last fall. Um, And they were just, you know, on a heater. Uh, Katie Craig especially had a really good uh, fall, Uh, went to the, you know, women's amateur, had a really good showing there. You know, pick right back up, third place finish here. The team finished second overall. Um, you know, fourth place finisher, three in the top 15, four in the top 25. I mean, just a really impressive showing by the golf team. So looking forward to watching them dominate the rest of the spring. Uh, on the track side of the sports, uh, at the Conference USA Championship, Nick Farnoff, he finished third in high jumps. Julian Cleaner finished third in the 400 meter. Uh, Natanya Linares finished third in the pentathlon, and Grace Turner finished second in the high jump, and Emilia Lesniak finished first in the high jumps. We really did a good sweep right there. Yeah, the high jump, you know, kind of dominating. You know, you finished first and second in the women's high jump. Uh, had several others on the podium. Uh, had a couple PRs in there. Um, just a really overall good showing at the uh, indoor track and field conference championships. Um, you know, too many results to list every single body that competed, but as always, those full results can be found on WKUSports.com. Now, moving into the first section of baseball in the Red Tail Wrap Up, baseball hosted Purdue Fort Wayne, and in game one, we lost uh, in a high scoring affair 13 to 14. Game two, we came back with revenge and won 10 to 1. Game three just continued the dominance and won 9 to 5, and in game four, uh, we held them scoreless, and we got five runs in. Yeah, I have a feeling um, after that 
offensive display that we saw in all four games. Unfortunately, we dropped the first one. Like you said, it was a, a shootout, 13-14. to 14. Uh, But then the rest of the game, you know, we're still just plating a lot of runs. I have a feeling we'll be talking about one of our hitters coming up next. But I love to see the baseball team uh, with a series win, you know, hosting Purdue-Fort Wayne, take a 3-1 series win. Uh, moving on to softball, softball hosted Detroit Mercer uh, and won 8-0. They also hosted St. Louis. Uh, in that first game of that series, and won six to five. Uh, then they hosted Eastern Illinois and won twelve to one. Then they had a rematch with Detroit Mercer and won thirteen to one. So really, just kicking ass there. And then they had uh, they hosted St. Louis again, but sadly they dropped this one seven to ten. Yeah, just like the the boys baseball, a lot of offense, a lot of firepower uh, on the diamond. Uh, what won four out of five games over the weekend, so a really good showing for softball. And again, I feel like we might be talking about a player that helped lead us to a lot of victories there on the softball diamond. Uh, women's basketball hosted MTSU at Dell Arena, and sadly, they dropped it 41 to 59. Yeah, we've talked about the women's basketball team all season. Uh, it's really just been an up and down roller coaster of a season. Very They've been very inconsistent. You know, they've now they're dealing with some injuries again. Um, but you know, they hosted a really good MTSU girls team that's, you know, I forget what their record is. They're like 22 and four on the season. Uh, they're not ranked yet. Um, uh, but I would bet by the end of the regular season that they're gonna be getting top 25 votes and possibly crack that top 25. They're a really good team, they're a really good program, have been for a long time. Uh, we obviously hate to lose to them in any hundred miles of hate matchup, but they won the women's matchup. Uh, moving on to tennis now. Uh, tennis hosted Wyoming and won four to three, and then they hosted University of Illinois Chicago and won four to two. So good weekend for the tennis team. Yeah, I'd like to see the tennis girls picking up some victories. Last time we talked about them, they took a couple L's. Um, so it's nice to see them bounce back. They're out, they're on like a seven game home uh, match streak before they go back on the road. So. Pick up a couple of W's. Hopefully, uh, you know, this week as they get into more this weekend, hopefully pick up a few more. Oh, for sure. Uh, WKU basketball, they have a sellout diddle promotion, $5 tickets. Game is a blackout. So if you do, uh, hopefully go to the game. Be sure to pick up some black threads or wear your black shirt, black jacket, black hat. Let's go and make this thing uh, diddle after dark, which, if you ask me, is a great slogan. Yeah, Ditto After Dark is nice. Uh, Blackout is nice. I, I have a feeling that the players got to pick that out for the last game, you know, what they wanted to wear. Uh, maybe the seniors picked that out. I'm not sure. I think last time when we talked about this game, I think they were doing a $10 ticket promotion. Uh, but since then, they've dropped the ticket price to $5. For any available seat, if it's for sale and you want to buy it, it is $5. Anywhere in the arena, not a certain section, not the nosebleeds, but any seat that is available is five dollars we're trying to pack diddle we're trying to sell out diddle so show up be loud wear black uh moving on to a former hilltopper malachi corley at number 44 on daniel jeremiah's top 50 draft prospects list yeah malachi just continues to rise up the draft stocks and the draft projections and the uh, just to mock drafts, if you know if you're keeping up with those sort of things, you know, leading into um, the combine week. Now that we're in, um, you know, I expect to see him climb even higher. You know, when he gets to doing some interviews, gets to do some on field, showing off his catch radius, uh, gets in the weight room, does the bench press, you know, runs the shuttle, runs the forty. Um, I really feel like he's gonna go nothing but up. Um, he's gonna be knocking on that late first round door you know, early, mid, second at the worst, you know, I'm feeling at this point. But Malachi is is earning everything that he's getting right now. You know, nothing was given to him. You know, he's busted his butt for, you know, three years plus now at Western. Um, and he's going to be a great NFL draft prospect. And I'm glad that a lot of the scouts and the NFL people and the draft people are really taking notice of that now. Yeah, for sure. I, I hope he uh, is moved to the number or the highest rank. Uh, the highest number draft pick for Western Kentucky football after, you know, this combine week. Uh, moving on, softball's Taylor Sanders 
named Conference USA Player of the Week. It is Sanders' first weekly award of the season and sixth of her career. Sanders led WKU with four home runs in five games over the weekend, totaling 19 bases and a 1.46 slugging rate. Uh, the third baseman also had uh, – or she picked up seven hits and 11 RB, RBIs for four WKU wins at home. Sanders is second in the league with an overall of uh, .911 slugging percentage and first in Conference USA with six home runs on the season. Yeah, when you go 4-1 and one over a weekend series and you just put up as many runs as we did over the weekend, um, you know, you're bound to have somebody leading that charge. And Taylor Sanders – uh, was the player four home runs in five games, um, you know, just having a really good start to the season uh, and earned that player of the week. So, you know, anytime one of our players gets recognized as the best player in Conference USA for the previous week, um, we're going to talk about that, and I'd love to hear it. Uh, moving on to the baseball player that you uh, previously kind of alluded to, WK Baseball, Blake Cavill. I'm going to call him Blake Bambino Cavill. Uh, named Conference USA Hitter of the Week, Cavill, a junior from Sydney, Australia, uh, went 11 for 16 for the week with a grand slam, two home runs, a two-run home run, four doubles, and 11 RBIs. The Hilltoppers infielder led WKU in 10 offensive categories, including batting average, hits, home runs, doubles, RBIs, runs, uh, total bases. He had 21 of that. Uh, walks, eight, slugging percentage, and on-base percentage. Cavill's offensive offensive performance lifted the Hilltoppers to a 4-1 record last week. They included an 8-5 win over Lipscomb on Tuesday and a series win through, uh, over Purdue-Fort Wayne last weekend. Yeah, I mean, you know, we alluded to it earlier. Um, baseball had another good week. They beat Lipscomb in the midweek, and then Purdue-Fort Wayne, they beat them 3-1 over the weekend. Um, and Blake Cavill has just been an absolute monster at the plate. I think he had three doubles in one game, um, a grand slam, a two-run homer. Um, he's just having a, a big breakout season to begin this year, um, and hopefully he keeps that up because you know, obviously we need the bats to be hot. We need the pitchers to be dealing, and uh, let's go win some ball games. So congratulations to Blake. Love to hear it. Now, speaking of baseball and softball, uh, today was not kind to him. Uh, baseball lost to the uh, UK uh, Wildcats 0-5, and softball lost to Louisville 1-4. Yeah, both of those games on the road, not at home, unfortunately. Um, you know, I would have tried to probably catch one of them if they were at home. You know, they do play us at home occasionally, though, and in baseball they will. But, um, yeah, both of our uh, baseball and softball teams lost to our in-state rivals there. Um, you know, we do beat them occasionally when we play. We play pretty consistently. But, you know, we had a chance this today, earlier as we record, late uh, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. Uh, but, unfortunately, we just came up short in both of those games. Uh, and also another bad news, Baylor is hiring Jamar Chaney as inside linebacker coach. Yeah, nothing but respect for Jamar. He um, actually left a, a dear WKU letter on his Twitter. So if you haven't seen that, uh, we retweeted that out. Uh, a lot of respect for Coach. I know he enjoyed his time at Western. You know, I've talked to him a little bit. Um, and, you know, can't wait to see where his coaching career and path takes him as he moves on to Baylor. And, uh, you know, just hopefully continues to be a successful coach. Uh, on lighter news, better news, Ty Rogers is being honored for the Kentucky High School Athletic Association uh, induction during the La Tech uh, game Wednesday night. So if you come out to the game, that's something else you get to see. Yeah, um, I think we, we mentioned that last episode that Ty Rogers was being inducted to the uh, Kentucky High School Athletics Hall of Fame. Uh, but now they just announced again earlier today, you know, it had been rumored for a few days that we would be honoring him. Uh, but it came out officially today, uh, Tuesday afternoon, that we would be honoring him during the game. So he will be present, I'm sure, with his family, uh, get to bring him out on the court, hopefully hear a few words for him. And, uh, you know, obviously everybody remembers the shot. You know, everybody remembers where they were, what they were doing, and just that crazy, crazy shot that he hit uh, to help us advance in the NCAA tournament. So. Really happy for Ty. Glad he's getting the recognition that he deserves, and you know, can't wait to see him back on campus. 
it, it is going to be an uh, an awesome event to to see. Uh, also, with Western winning that game, I got it. I got down as us winning the latte game. Uh, Red Tail Trust officially hit a hundred subscriber members and is having a members only pregame tailgate before the La Tech game. Yeah, you know, we had been you know making a pretty good push to get to 100 members um you know just kind of spreading the word every time somebody joined you know kind of helping push that information out there so people know um it had been a goal of ours to hit 100 members we finally have done that obviously this is just beginning of where we want to get to and want to go to um but you know it's, it's the first you know small milestone of of many in the future and then that members only pregame tailgate that we're having uh wednesday before the game from 5 30 till tip off uh, it's going to be in the auxiliary gyms at Diddle Arena. If you're a Red Tail Trust member, you should have received an email invitation. Uh, you should have RSVP'd. Um, so, you know, we hope to see you there. I'm sure Tyler and myself will both be there and, and can't wait to, uh, you know, see everybody there. And some football players should be joining us. So it's going to be a good time. Ooh, boy, that will be a good time. Now, I'm going to let you give your thoughts on this next uh, part first before I give mine. Uh, WKU to the Mac Rumors. Yeah, I've, I've been pretty vocal on on this on our Twitter account, on the podcast Twitter account. Um, granted, it is my opinions. I'm sharing my opinions, not necessarily Tyler's. He will tell his here in a moment. But, um, yeah, there was a Toledo writer who not long after the UMass to the MAC uh, broke that they were joining the MAC conference uh, next year. You know, a, a writer from Toledo broke that, you know, keep your eye on Western Kentucky. There's also interest uh, in us joining as well. And I'm just quick. I, I'm not shooting it down. I'm not saying it can't happen or it won't happen. I'm just I'm just going to put it out there that I don't want it to happen. I don't want that uh, geographical recruiting footprint. I don't want those games up in nowhere, Ohio and nowhere, Michigan, where it's cold and those uh, midweek games in November. Um, you know, I, I like where Conference USA has gone since, you know, the last couple of years when we were on literally on life support with four teams left. Um, I think we've made some good additions. The league has been competitive in both football and now in basketball. Um, you know, it's a pretty good baseball league as we're seeing that pretty good softball league. We're seeing that. So, um, you know, right now it's just rumors. You know, I don't think there's any smoke to the fire. But, you know, people are chattering and talking about it. We put up a poll, you know, what do the WKU fans want to see? I think it was something like 43% wanted to stay in the current CUSA, 32% wanted to go to the MAC, uh, and the rest, you know, the 18 20%, whatever it was, wanted to go other, whether that's AAC or Sunbelt or who knows where. I don't, I'm not sure uh, what their other options were, but they didn't want the, um, the MAC or the current Conference USA. But, you know, I'm going to let my opinion be known loud and clear. You know, ever since it came up the first time when we, it was rumored that we were going to go with Middle Tennessee, you know, I was quick to throw my hand up and say, hey, I don't want this. I want no part of that. Nothing has changed. I'd rather stay where we are in Conference USA. Um, you know, I'm not saying that I just I necessarily want to be here forever. Um, you know, as the landscape of college football changes, you know, I feel like we're still going to see more realignment occur from the big p4 p5 conferences and i think that's going to create a trickle down ripple effect as some of the other you know smaller the g5 guys start getting rated to backfill those positions um and i think eventually we're going to have an opportunity to move somewhere else i don't know where that'll be but i don't want it to be the mac quite frankly and i'm going to be open and frank about that until that rumor dies and is put to bed. So Tyler, what are your thoughts on it? Well, I think the Mac is, it's not even a lateral move. I I feel like if you're going to make a move, uh, it's either got to be lateral or straight ahead. And I think the Mac is actually going into reverse. Um, You're right. I mean, why in the hell would we want to go up to Ohio or nowhere, Michigan um, and play? And I know people, complain about having uh, uh, weekday games in Conference USA. You know, they started this this season, this football season in, uh, in like, November – or, I'm sorry, October, November. That started with MAC in the MACTION. Like, why would – no. 
I feel like that's a ter- that would be a terrible move. I seriously hate that conference. I don't want anything to do with that conference. I didn't even know Western Michigan Broncos was even a university. If you would have came up on the streets and asked me what conference I was in, I wouldn't have told you. I'd probably say D2. Um, I, I, I think it would be a terrible, terrible move. And anyone who says that's a good move, I, I seriously judge your – your knowledge. Um, I mean, Miami, Miami, Ohio Red Hawks, uh, Ohio Bobcats. There you go. But Buffalo Bulls. What have they done in football? Keith Wilcutt. Um, I saw on his Twitter where he released a like a, a, a side by side comparison of Conference USA and where those sports ranked in the Ken Palm uh, and in other, I, I think, in other rankings versus. The Mac and the Conference USA is better in every one. So why would we go from up here on Mount Everest to down here on in the freaking valley? I I think it'd be the dumbest move possible if we put ourselves out of Conference USA, which I don't know if you know this or not. We lost to every four new members of Conference USA in football this season. We didn't win one game. Like I know that's terrible to say, but why would you want to go into the MAC? That those people can't wait to get out of there. No one wants to go up in Ohio and freezing temperatures or Michigan. That's stupid for Maction. Maction can kiss my ass. I say we stay in Conference USA until something better comes along. What that may be, I don't know, but something's got to to break for us and not go into reverse to the MAC conference. But that's 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 just my opinion. Uh, I'm very, very strong about this because I hate, hate Ohio with a passion. Uh, there's nothing pretty about that, that state. It's the armpit right next to – we got two armpits, Indiana, Ohio, right there. I want nothing to do with that. Michigan, I don't I, – no, I, I would never drive to – any of them states to watch a football or basketball game wouldn't do it. Um, it'd just be a waste of time. And I feel like a bunch of Western fans feel the same way. Um, but you're right. I don't want to stay in Conference USA forever. I just want to move up, not back. But that, that, that that's the end of my rant. Um, uh, if I offend anybody, grow up. Yeah, no, definitely uh, worth ranting about. And it's, yeah, you know, we'll keep our eye on that. If there's anything new to report or share, we'll obviously share that. But that uh, that does conclude the Red Tower wrap up, as always, brought to you by Trent Betting. I think Trent and Little Trent got their money's worth today because that was a heck of a wrap up. Now we're going to jump into the main segment of the episode, and that is recapping uh, our 100 Miles of Hate uh, rematch that we had with MTSU this past Saturday. Um, down in Murfreesboro, uh, there was an announced crowd of 5,038 people in attendance. I think most of those were dressed as blue chairbacks um, or bleachers that were pushed in. I'm not really sure where they got that count from, but maybe they were counting teeth in the crowd. I'm not really sure where they got that from. Uh, unfortunately, MTSU did come away with, a, I guess you could call it a controversial win. They won the game 72-74, to 74, so... Tyler, before we jump into stats um, and indicators, grades, all that stuff, how did this 100 Miles of Hate game feel for you? Obviously, we got to go and, and attend it in person. How was it for you? Well, the the Murphy Center uh, is garbage. Uh, the only nice thing about it was the lady at the concession stand who helped me, you, and Jepson out every time we went up there and get some adult beverages. Other than that, that arena is garbage. Um, it just reeks of poverty. Uh, the rest, the, the game was bull crap. Um, I ain't scared to admit it. The rest uh, made some terrible calls, especially there at the end with that uh, when they blew that call. Uh, I think he should have to explain himself because, I mean, obviously he knew they had no timeouts left. People on TV saw where he was trying to call the MTSU players trying to call the timeout. And the ref just absolutely crapped his pants. Um, I, I would love to have a rematch of this game because I think it would go completely different. 
OG next to us, so that liar in chief where he was <laughs> where Coleman Jones hit that first three and he's like, Can he do that? And the guy was like, No. And then he rattled off two more, the best of my knowledge. And that old boy sitting over there smiling like a like a fat cat over there, like a like a crap uh possum possum eating crap over there. Uh, I, I hope he's doing good though, because that dude was pretty cool. Um but no, uh Whenever we had like six turnovers in the first nine and a half, ten minutes, um, I was thinking, man, it's too much, and it took us too long to score. Uh, it took us like three, four minutes before we actually got on the board. Um, I feel like we didn't play our best game. In fact, I know we didn't play our best game, and we're going to get into that. But, um, man, this this one was – a hard one to sit there and watch knowing that we are a, a so much better team than what we saw out there on the floor. Yeah. Like you said, the game did start really rough. We started slow. Um, overall is probably one of our, one of our worst performances of the season, especially when we jump into the stats later. Um, I think that'll paint that picture. Uh, you know, Jared Coleman Jones had quite frankly had, Probably his best game of the season, I'd say. Probably one of his better games of his career. And you're right. He hit that first three-pointer. We had this old MTSU fan sitting next to us. And I looked over and I said, Jared Coleman Jones can do that? He can he can step out and hit threes? He said, no, no, he can't do that. And I was like, all right, cool. He hit one. All right, he's, he got made a lucky shot. Uh, when that boy pulled up two more and hit and laced them, I said, like, oh, gee, you lied to me? And uh, he was just over smiling, like you said. So, Props to him. Uh, he got one over on us. Jared Coleman Jones had a really good game. 20 points, 11 rebounds to lead MTSU in scoring and in rebounds. Justin Porter had a pretty good game, 19 points and four rebounds. Elias King had 12 points and four rebounds. And all those were three-pointers in the second half to help uh, keep MTSU in the lead uh, before we were able to make a late run and get back into the game uh, before that heartbreaking end. Now, on the WKU side of things, uh, our leading scorer was Brandon Newman. He had 14 points and four rebounds. Don McHenry had 11 points and six rebounds. Dante Allen had 11 points and five rebounds. Rodney Howard had 11 points and seven rebounds. And Baba Carfai had 10 points and three rebounds. Uh, even though he picked up two early fouls in this game, like in the first two minutes, he picked up two fouls, uh, went to the bench for the rest of the first half, so really didn't play a lot of minutes but still was impactful when he did play 10 points, three rebounds and really limited action, uh, you know, a physical game. And he just got, you know, caught with some, what I don't think were really good foul calls, but it is what it is. Uh, he was called for him. He went to the bench, but still made an impact when he was in the game. So Tyler, you know, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the player performances for both uh, MTSU and, and Western before we jump into the indicators and grades? Well, Jerry Coleman Jones, uh, he played, um, he played lights out. I mean, he went out three or four from three point land, um, six or fourteen from the field, eleven rebounds. Um, I mean, that that was a dominant performance by him. Uh, Porter, gosh, I hate that man. Uh, granted, he was six for sixteen. Um, you know, I mean. It, I'm not going – I don't want to give MTSU props, and I feel like I shouldn't really just had two players that really play good. And, I mean, a bunch of them fouls that Western got called for were bull crap. You know, the whistles only went one way, but MTSU got some home cooking. Um, uh, I feel like Tegan Moore, you know, he came in three points. You know, he had been producing at a high level. And, you know, this was just one of his off games, uh, one of three from the field, one of two from free throw line. Um, you know, McHenry, he kind of had a non-characteristic game, only went for 11 points. You know, typically he's close to getting over 20. Um, Newman and, and, and Allen and, you know, the 14 and 11, both of them play good. Fai, um you're right. In his, he only played ten minutes, got ten points. Um, hired seven rebounds, eleven points. Uh, you know, he really came in clutch there. And even OG next to us, he was like, whenever Hired went in, he was like, "Why doesn't he play more?" And we were like, 
you know, I mean, he, he can, um, but that's coach's decision, whatever coach thinks is best, you know, he's going to go with, um, I feel like in the first half we shot, I know we shot, uh, 15 three pointers. This was a terrible three point game for us. Um, we were like four fifteen in the first half, second half. We'll get to that in a second. Um, but like I, I said earlier, this was probably one of our worst uh, team performances. Um, I feel like we've had, in, especially in con- it definitely in conference play, I feel like um, everything else, you know, in the non-con, you know, when we played Wichita State and didn't have a single three-point shot. Um, I feel like this was just a one-off, though. I feel like I'm, I'd rather get this game out of our system right now than here when we go into conference tournament. So if we had to take that L in the 100 miles of hate for us to go and dominate conference tournament, I will take that. But um, And hopefully we did get that bad game out of our system and we're done with it. We won't have another game like this in the remaining three games of the regular season and then moving right into conference uh, USA tournament. Yeah, you know, I feel like it really boiled down to MTSU was more aggressive than us. Um, I think they hustled more than us. You know, I think they were getting loose balls, um, you know, getting more rebounds. And typically we have a pretty good rebounding margin. They actually won the rebounding battle this game. Um, and just overall, I think they wanted this victory more. It was on their home court, you know, had a decent crowd of uh, 5,000 chairbacks plus. Um, and they, they just, they stole this victory. You know, if you want to look at, you know, how the game ended and it was controversial and the video shows the guy obviously called timeout and he was given a jump ball instead of a technical when, the, you know, they were leading by one, we would have had two shots, um, a chance to take the lead, you know, with three seconds ish left. Um, you know, but then if you listen to the coach speak after the game, you know, we never should have been in that position. We should have played cleaner ball. We should have been more aggressive. We should have out hustled them and never put the game in the hands of a referee making the correct call. You know, maybe he should have made the correct call, but, you know, those things are going to happen. They're humans. They're going to make mistakes. Um, we have to take care of what we can take care of and, and win these ball games. And this was a tough one to lose. Um, and when you start to look at these stats, and we, you know, we talked about both of us saying that this was probably our worst game in quite a while, uh, definitely probably in conference play. But looking at the key indicators for this game, WKU shot 37.3% from the field, uh, which is about 10 percentage points below our season average. MTSU shot 34.9% from the field. Uh, Three-point land, we shot 25%. We were five out of 20, which, uh, you know, we didn't take a lot, but we didn't make very many either. And MTSU shot 35.7%. They were 10 out of 28, so plus five from three-point land. That's a 15-point difference for them. And, you know, quite frankly was the reason why they probably pulled this game out. They just made a lot of timely threes. We talked about Porter. Uh, we talked about Elias King. We talked about Jared Coleman Jones. You know, when they had the lead and were keeping us at arm distance for a lot of that first half and then early middle second half before we made the run and come back, it was because they were hitting timely threes. Um, and quite frankly, we weren't. You know, our, our three-point defense, which had been good, a lot of conference play, um, just allowed them to make some shots. Uh, free throws, we were 23 out of 29, so a good showing there. Uh, they were 20 out of 30. Uh, then rebounds, you know, usually we're number one in the conference and, you know, top 30 in the nation. We got out-rebounded out 43 to 42. Again, that's hustle. You know, that's 50-50 balls. That's just guys that have to want it more than the other team uh, and, and secure the ball, get us the possession, and go the other way. But we didn't do that. Then turnovers were about even, uh, 12 for us, 11 for them. Um, all that basically shakes out to what we had, a, a close, ugly, physical, sloppy game um, that was there for the taking at the end, quite frankly. You know, we could have easily won that ball game, uh, but MTSU wanted it more, um, and the refs made sure that they got that victory. So, Tyler, let's jump into some grades and flush this game behind us and look forward to, you know, the two games we have coming this week. So, let's jump into some grades. What do you got for the offense versus MTSU? Well, the offense was below our season average in points. Um, I'm going – and, you know, whenever your MTSU is getting threes and you're coming down there and shooting uh, – hitting one of two on the free throw line, 
you know, you, you, you're going to lose that one. Um, I can't give him an F. I feel like a C minus D plus for it for the offensive effort. Yeah, I'm right there with you. A C minus. You know, it feels like we early in the game we couldn't buy a jumper. You know, when, you know, first three, four minutes, five minutes. Um, you know, a perimeter shot just was not going down. Then later, as we got settled down, got into the flow of the game, um, the game was really physical. It just seemed like we couldn't finish around the basket like we had been. Baba Carr, Rodney. Um, Tegan, Don, even, you know, just, it, it just wasn't our night. It was a physical game. We weren't getting foul calls necessarily. Um, you know, question that or not, you know, we weren't getting them. We weren't making the shots. Um, and the offense just didn't have the output that we needed to win the game. So I think a C minus is fair. What about the defense versus MTSU? Well, I think they scored over their season average. Uh, and like I said, they kept, they out rebounded us. Um, our three-point defense just wasn't there. Um, and we did foul. We had 23s, th- 23 personal fouls of their 18. You know, you, you got to guard without fouling. Um, I'll give defense a uh, – I guess just a C normal, you know. A, uh, just a, just a, a C. Yeah, I'm going with a C as well. It wasn't a terrible defensive effort. Um it, it was we defensively we did enough to win this ball game, you know, quite frankly. Um, yes, they made some threes, um, you know, at a higher rate than we would have liked to have seen and higher rate than we've given up recently. Um, but they still only score 74 points. And we normally score around 80. Um, you know, we just need to play better on the offensive end. You know, defensively we could have played better, closed out better, rotated better, guarded without fouling. There were several and one opportunities there, like you mentioned. Um, you know, guarding without fouling is always going to be uh, something we have to do better. You know, we saw Baba Carr get in foul trouble early. Uh, Christian had several fouls that were just kind of questionable. Uh, Rodney did. Um, just all across the board, you know, we just had fouls that, you know, at times bailed them out and put them on the free throw line when, you know, the possession was winding down and probably would have been a bad or rush shot. So, I'm going to give him a C. It wasn't a terrible effort, but obviously it could have been better. There's always room to improve, you know, even if we had won this game by 20. You know, there's always room to improve, but we lost by two, um, but still a C effort. What about the coaching in this game? I don't know what the coach's game plan was. Uh, I wish I was privy to that information. Um, and I, I didn't get to listen to the to the post-game uh, coaches' uh, radio talk. Um I do wish he would have been a little bit more aggressive with the with the refs and maybe, you know, sometimes it does pay for the coach to get a tech because, you know, that kind of fires the team up. Um, I'm not saying Lutz isn't uh, serious or, you know, doesn't look, you know, like he's taking it serious over there because, I mean, he does, and especially when he talks. You know, he demands high performance and and uh, and, and attention to detail in, every, in, in all the players. But um, – I'm going to give the coaches, uh, I think, a C in this game. Um, you know, in, on the offense side of the ball, there was plenty of of uh, turnovers that, that me and you saw where they just threw the ball straight to the MTSU player. Uh, I probably should have threw that in the offensive grades. But, you know, coach, he, he took them out. You know, he probably tried to correct them. And for some reason, you know, um, it just didn't click. So I'm going to give coaches a C in this game. Yeah, the coaching grade is usually one of the hardest ones. I mean, you know, the coaches don't draw and design plays that end in turnovers. They don't draw and design a, a you know a game plan where we shoot 38, 39% from the field or 25% from three or have more turnovers than we wanted or just get out-rebounded. You know, obviously the coaches want to, you know, play a perfect game, have a nice game plan and, and win the game. And sometimes you just don't make the shots or sometimes the other team just outplays you, out-hustles you, out-whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm not mad at this coaching staff. I feel like in years past, this would have been a, uh, you know, 10 to 15 point victory for MTSU as physical as they were playing, um, you know, kind of rocking us early in the game. And then early second, early middle second half, jumping out to another, you know, seven, eight point lead that we had to claw back into. Um, you know, I feel like the coaching kept us in this game. Um, you know, we had to, sometimes we just had to slow ourselves down and get into the flow of the offense, not rush things, not turn the ball over. Um, 
So, uh, you know, uh, it's tough to grade coaching because obviously Lutz wanted to play better than what we did. Uh, but I'm right there with you. You know, I think a C is fair. You know, win the ball game and it's an it's A or B easily. But we lost this one. You don't, you know, this is one you don't ever want to lose, but we did just lose it barely. Um, but that's just how it goes. What about your overall grade at MTSU? Uh, I feel like it's going to have to be a C. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, I mean, as we mentioned, not, not our best. Uh, I feel like even if we had just a, you know, a little bit more effort, uh, I feel like we definitely could have beat this team. Uh, the shots just wasn't falling on, on for us on offense. Uh, you know, you'd see brick after brick after brick. I feel like we, we were kind of forcing the three point shot as well. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give them, I'm just going to give overall C in this game. Yeah, I think overall C is fair. You know, I'm going with a C as well. Um, you know, just offensively, just, you know, the percentages we shot weren't great. Getting out rebound is not great. Turnovers, you know, 12 turnovers, we can live with that in a lot of ball games. You know, ultimately it was too many in this game. Um, but overall, I think it was an average output for us. Um, we we're still right there with the chance to win this game at the very end. So I think a C is fair. Um in this loss. Now, normally we don't always do a fan grade for the, uh, an away game, but um, since you and I and a, a buddy of ours, Adam went down to the game uh, and were there and able to take it in and had a lot of uh, our red clad friends there with us, we got to give a grade to the Hilltopper faithful that made that trip to Murfreesboro. We saw a lot of people at toots before the game. We saw some people at toots after the game you know, made a double header of our toots visit um, and then enjoyed a basketball game between. So what about the Hilltopper fans and how they traveled down to Murfreesboro? Uh, I'm going to say if it wasn't for the Hilltoppers being there, that place, I mean, our MTSU might as well put just like plastic or like, you know, in the football, in their football stadium, how they have like the coverings over the seats because they know no one's going to come there and watch them. MTSU might as well do that in the Murphy Center. Um, in the video that they were showing on the on you know on the videos uh, board um, where it said in Middle Tennessee, like the players will be playing a Conference USA game or a basketball official basketball game, and there there was just empty seats up behind them. Uh, that's that's just pathetic. Uh, the tops the topper fans, whenever we went down there, I mean, it was crazy hearing you know T O P S tops 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 or or the other chance for Western uh, in there kind of drowned out uh, the Middle Tennessee chance. So the fan effort for being an away game, I'm going to give them an A, man. I mean, it, it was a great experience for my first time being in the glass house. Uh, definitely a an, an A for me. Yeah, the Hilltopper faithful, Hilltopper Nation definitely gets an A. You know, Coach Lutz uh, mentioned it after the game that they, the staff and players really appreciated everybody that made that 100 mile trip down there. Um, I know I about lost my voice that next day. I was a little hoarse waking up because we led so many TOPS chants, uh, a lot of defense chants. Um, just had a really good time being loud and trying to make an impact um, and just, you know, letting it know in your, you know, in your face right beside us, OG and our little buddy that was sitting over there. Yeah, you, know, you gotta have a little good fun banter at an uh, an away game. Everything was respectful. Um, it was just a rough game to watch. The fans, we we had fun. We came, we saw, we took a loss, we went back home. Um, it is what it is. But yeah, the fans definitely get an A. That was a great traveling group. Um, you know, we saw that the Blue Raider women they brought a good contingent down to Diddle earlier in the day. So it was nice to return the favor and have a big loud group of red there at the glass house. So definitely an A for the fans that made the trip. We closed the book on that game. We flush it away. Like you said, hopefully we got that out of our system and we look forward to our matchup. That is Wednesday. Uh, you know, as, as we record this, it's Wednesday morning. So when this episode comes out, it'll be, you know, the early morning hours of Wednesday, just hours before this game kicks off. We play uh, Wednesday, two twenty eight at 7 PM on ESPN plus. It is the final home game at Diddle Arena this season. It is a blackout. There is a sellout Diddle promotion being pushed. Um, last I've heard, I think we're around 700 tickets left available to, to buy. So um, those tickets are $5 each. 
So we should have a pretty loud and rowdy crowd. Um, we do know that a lot of that is going to hinge on the students showing up. You know, there was a video released by WKU Basketball today of the team getting out and giving away energy drinks to students and just trying to encourage people to come to the game. So hopefully they heed that uh, invitation. They take that and they show up to the game. Um, they are giving away free black T-shirts. Um, I think it was to the first 500 fans. And then um, Steve Lutz is also buying con concession vouchers for the first 1,000 students. So you can get whatever frosty beverage of your choice. So, you know, hopefully they show up. I know last time when he did that, we had a really good turnout. Um, last home game of the season against a preseason favorite uh, in Louisiana Tech that is tied for first right now. So this game does mean something. Uh, we beat them earlier this season. Um, we enter the game at 19 and eight overall. We are eight and five in Conference USA play. Louisiana Tech is 20 and eight overall. They're 10 and three in Conference USA play. Uh, this is a rematch from February 7th, uh, where we were able to get an 81 to 76 victory down in Ruston. Uh, the ESPN Power Index, though really likes Louisiana Tech, 66.3% chance for them to win uh, on the road at Diddle. And then the betting lines, if you're into uh, the Vegas betting, Louisiana Tech is a 1.5 favorite, and the over-under is set at 146.5. So, Tyler, before we jump into, you know, the players to know, stats, et cetera, you know, how does this rematch feel to you at Diddle Arena? Because it's sure to be a jam-packed environment. Well, I feel like, uh, you know, they're definitely going to want some some revenge. You know, we fouled out, uh, or Isaiah Crawford and Bacho both fouled out last game. And, uh, you know, that was a major turning point. We were the aggressor, and I feel like they're going, they're going to want to return the favor. Um, you know, they didn't have Talik Chavez last game, and he's a, he's a weapon that they miss. Um I feel like, you know, they, they lead Conference USA right now in the basketball standing. So I think this is going to be a great game between basically, I, I'm going to say two heavyweights uh, of the Conference USA basketball, um, uh, you know, conference. And I feel like this is going to want to, this is going to be a game that you are not going to want to miss. This is, this is going to be must watch TV, must watch, you know, come in, watch it live because, and, and, and get the popcorn because it's about to be a show. We're getting the popcorn. We're getting the tacos, and then we're getting the popcorn. Yeah, you know, if you remember, you know, like you said, we beat them down in uh, Ruston. Um, they were without the one of their three-point weapons, Talik Chavez, uh, Bacho, and Isaiah Crawford did foul out. They were, they were just a really aggressive and physical defensive team. That's their identity. That's what they want to do. But unfortunately, you know, that – physicality led to them getting in some foul trouble. Uh, you know, kind of like, you know, we've, we've been preaching all season. We have to guard without fouling. Uh, they were unable to do that. A couple of their leading players ultimately fouled out of that game early, and we were able to get out of there with the, uh, you know, pretty comfortable victory. It was a five-point victory. Um, you know, never really felt in jeopardy coming down the stretch. So a really good victory. It had been a long time since we had won in Ruston. Um and, yeah, they're going to want re a rematch. They're going to want a revenge in this game. Um, they are led there by Isaiah Crawford. He's their leading scorer. He's averaging 16.3 points per game. Their leading rebounder is the previously mentioned Daniel Bacho. He's averaging 10.1 rebounds per game. Then their leading passer is Sean Newman, Jr., who's averaging 5.1 assists per game. Uh, we mentioned that they were without Talik Chavez the first matchup this year. He is fourth in Conference USA with 2.7 three-pointers made per game on the season. So can be a shooter. Um, you know, If you leave him open, he's going to make you pay for it. So we've definitely got to be aware of that um, and just not let that be you know, what gets us, what sinks us this game like it you know, ultimately kind of did last game when MTSU made 10 of those. Now looking at the team stats, uh, WKU is averaging 80 points per game on the season, while Louisiana Tech is averaging 74.5. Uh, points allowed, we're giving up 73.8. They're giving up 63.2. So, again, a very good defensive team, very good inside, if you remember Bacho. And then they had another big guy, Mangum. Um, you know, they're just really physical. Crawford is a big physical guy. 
Um, they play tough in your face defense and, you know, holding people to 63 points is really impressive. Uh, field goal percentage, we're shooting 46.7% on the year. Tech is shooting 45.8. Then rebounds per game, we're averaging 40.2 while they're averaging just below us at 38.9. So really this, you know, this has all the makings to be, like you said, a slugfest, you know, two of the better teams in Conference USA. Um, you know, we're going to have to play our best game to get this victory. And we're going to have to play just as focused and just as clean as we did with down in Ruston, you know, to, to beat them and, and quite frankly, beat them at their own game, you know, be better defensively than them. We have the offense, you know, that's not a question. We're going to play fast. You know, we've got, you know, four five, six guys that can score double figures on any given night. So I'm not worried about the offense inside the ball. It's just, you know, how, how, much offensively do we allow them to get? You know, how well do we allow them to shoot? You know, we have to be better defensively, defend without fouling, like we always say. So, that being said, let's jump into some keys to victory for Louisiana Tech. Tyler, what's your first one? My first one was going to be contain the Crawfords, uh, Jordan and Isaiah, because Jordan torched us for 25 points in the previous game. He was 11 of 15 from the field goal, 1 of 3 from the uh, beyond the arc. Um, I was going to say contain the Crawfords, Bacho, and Chavez. But I'm also going to throw in the Mangum because he was 5 of 10 from the uh, from beyond the arc and 6 of 13 from the field. Uh, and he got it for 23. Uh, and Jordan Crawford is coming off the bench, or he did uh, against us down there at Reston. So, yeah, contain – Crawford's Bacho, and I'm going to just say uh, Mangum. I'm going to go with uh, my first key to victory is going to be we just have to want it more than them. You know, we have to be the aggressor. We have to be, you know, win the hustle plays. We have to out rebound them. You know, they have an elite rebounder in Daniel Bacho that's averaging over 10 rebounds per game. Um, you know, that's a hustle stat, that's an effort stat. You know, if you want that ball, you've got to go get it and prevent him from getting the ball, whether that's offensively or defensively. And we've got to be on the glass, securing the ball and getting it up the court uh, for our team. Now all the hustle plays, the 50-50 balls, um, deflections, steals, et cetera, um, diving on the floor for loose balls, just whatever it is. We have to be the team that wants it more. You know, we saw a game most recently against MTSU slip out of our fingers that, you know, quite frankly, they probably just played a little harder. They wanted a little bit more. So we've got to flip the script. We've got to do what we did down in Ruston and do it here at Diddle with the energy of what's surely going to be a really good crowd and want it more than them. What's your second key to victory? Uh, real quick before I get into that, Batch is averaging a double-double, uh, 14.5 points, 10.1 rebounds per game. So definitely going to have to keep an eye on him and not let him just – gobble up them offense, defensive rebounds, and, you know, get easy putbacks. Uh, second key to victory is I'm going to uh, call on something we did down there. We got fouls on Crawford and Bacho and got them out of the game. Uh, if we could foul them out maybe a little bit sooner in this game, get some, you know, some home cooking like we saw down there at MTSU, I wouldn't be mad at it in, in this instant. But, uh, yeah, try, try to get their stars out of the game as quick as possible. Uh, by getting them fouls, you know, maybe two, three in the first half. Uh, two in the first half, their coach ain't going to put them in there with three. Uh, and then just drive, be aggressive, drive into their chest, um, especially Bacho, take it to him in, in the lane and get fouls on him. Yeah, I'm going to go with, um, you know, something that's we've actually been a lot better at recently, but we've got to take care of the ball, you know, not have dumb turnovers. Again, granted, we've been better, you know, for the last five games. I think we've been under, you know, 13, 14 turnovers. Uh, this is going to be a, a rowdy environment. This is going to be a team that we know is very aggressive defensively. Um, they challenge a lot of shots. They get a lot of blocks uh, at the rim and in the paint. So we have to take care of the ball. We know they're good defensively. You know, if they're holding teams to 63 points per game, um, we're going to have to value the ball and be very efficient all the offensive ends. So, Limit our turnovers, keep that number, you know, as close to 10 to 12 as possible. And I think that's going to give us a really good chance to win. What is your third key to victory against Louisiana Tech? 
uh, 13 victories don't force a three. I feel like we did that versus MTSU. Um, and, you know, that's why we was 4-15 in the first half and, you know, ended up being 5-20. Um, you know, whenever you force it and don't come, you know, natural to you, you're in, you know, it, it's going more than likely to be a miss. Um, so, you know, kind of play from the inside out. I've said that multiple times, you know. Make the shots easier on you by getting them to, you know, stuff the paint or pack the paint and then have your shooter or two shooters come out on your winger in the corner and feed them and let them get the easy shot. Don't, just don't force anything and let it let the game come to you. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a really tough matchup down low with uh, Bacho, Bacho and Mangum with uh, Baba and Rodney, but I think both of those guys are, the one, they're very complimentary of each other. They're both very good and can be very efficient at the basket. Um, but I think we, like you said, we have to be aggressive. We have to keep feeding the ball down to those guys, let those guys go to work against Bacho or whoever's guarding them down there. Um, and like you said earlier, potentially get them in foul trouble. Um, I also think we have to guard without fouling. You know, that kind of goes without saying. We can't get guys in foul trouble that have to go sit on the bench um, and miss extended playing time. We can't just give up free points at the free throw line. We need to be, you know, plus there. That old Stansbury model, we want to make more than they attempt. Um, we just need to be aggressive getting the ball into the paint and defending without fouling. I think those are definitely must for my third key to victory. Uh, who's going to be your MVT versus Louisiana Tech? Well, see, this one, I'm torn. You know, Bob Carr, he's good at defense and rebounding. And, you know, whenever he gets the ball down low, he's going to, he's going to slam it. Uh, Rodney. He's being 6'11", Bacho 6'11". You know, uh, Bob Carr's giving up some height to Bacho um, and probably some weight as well. Um, so I'm going to have to go with Rodney again. You know, he he scored, what, um, this last game. He had 18 points, which I think this is when his, uh, when his high scoring points eventually, you know, started kind of. Um, he, he was aggressive on the offensive side, getting six rebounds in that game. Uh, so I'm gonna go with Ronnie Hyatt again. I, I, you know, I, I feel like him and Bacho is going to be a matchup to watch, and whoever I think wins that is an indicator of how this game is going to go. I'm going with Don McHenry. I think, uh, you know, Don is going to get back on track, he's going to be in front of a, a loud and rowdy, uh, Ditto Arena crowd. And I think he's really going to feed into that. We've seen a couple of times where just first half, second half, whatever it is, he just catches fire and will go, you know, three in a row, four in a row, five in a row, 17 points in a row. Um, he can string off those kind of scoring runs by himself. And I think he's really going to be pumped up by the crowd that's going to be on hand for this last home game of the season. So I think it's Don McHenry uh, getting back on track, bouncing back from that 11 point performance against MTSU and helping lead us to victory. And what is your score prediction for this game? So I'm going to keep it kind of close to what uh, the last game was. Uh, I think we score we score a few more, and they score a few more but less than we do. Uh, I'm going to go with 88-79 tops win. So, you know, a good nine-point victory. But, hey, if you're betting the spread, Western will cover then. I say point and a half underdogs. Um, I think Ken Palm has Tech winning this game by six. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit closer fair. I've got Western 82, Louisiana Tech 79. So give me a three point victory, um, high scoring affair. But I, I, you know, I surely think we can. It's pretty close to what we scored uh, the score from last game when we played them. And I think, you know, I'll, I, honestly, I think we can score more than that if we're just as efficient and take care of the ball as we can be. But give me 82-79. I think that'll be a nice, solid victory in front of what should be, again, you know, nearly 7,000-plus rowdy Hilltoppers in attendance. So I'm ready for it. Now, moving on, uh, looking at our Saturday game, uh, we have a game at FIU. That game is on Saturday, March 2nd. It's on ESPN+. Plus. The game is at 5 p.m. Currently, WKU, like we said earlier, is 19-8, and 8-5 eight, eight in conference. FIU is nine and nineteen and four and nine in conference play. 
Uh, this is a rematch from the January 25th game in which Western won 105-91. to um, And the ESPN Power Index likes WK to, WKU to win even on the road, which has been rare this season. They give us a 54.1% chance of winning this game. So, Tyler, how does this rematch feel with the scrappy FIU team? Hopefully our defense is a little bit better this game and it's not such a high scoring affair on, on FIU's part. Um, you know, I mean, they really have nothing to lose. So I feel like kind of like MTSU, they are going to try to play spoiler. They're going to uh, try to embarrass us on their home court. Uh, and we, we, we just can't allow them to do that. You know, I mean, they're the basement dwellers of the basement dwellers. Um them and UTEP side by side, same conference record. Um, you know, I think the last, what was the last game they won was Liberty. And that was at home, 76 71. So, you know, Liberty's good th- at shooting the threes. Uh, I think they actually the conference in three point percentage. Um, you know, I don't know why they scored 91 points on us at home. Probably should never happen, but. You're right, they're scrappy. They was playing probably out their ass. Uh, I don't see lightning striking twice, and I don't see them doing that again. Now, like I said, they are fighting to play spoiler, so it's not going to be a cakewalk. Uh, You know, we're going to have to come play or else we're going to have the same feeling as we did whenever we lost to, to MTSU this past weekend. And I'm still red assed about losing to MTSU. I'm going to be honest with you i hate them i i hate the blue raiders i all right moving on uh it i i do think this will be a good game uh now they are giving up uh they're giving up more points than they're scoring which is good for us because we average 80 points a game um i think this will be a good western Kentucky, or i won't say easy it'll be a good western Kentucky victory game if you remember the first game we played, um, this game was right kind of smack dab in the kind of a trio of games that we played against teams that are just really aggressive defensively. And FIU is one that is near. I'm not sure if they're still um, leading the nation in turnovers force per game, but when we played them the first time in January, they were near the nation's leader in uh, turnovers force per game. I think they broke their program season record for steals in a season in that game in January. Um, So they're really aggressive defensively. They're going to try to be causing a lot of havoc and turning you over full court pressure. Um, So we've got to be ready to bring it. You know, I'm sure when we get the keys to victory, we'll have some uh, wash, rinse, and repeat things that you just, we hear a lot from us that we have to do to win these games. Um, but looking at their leading players, um, they have a sweep here. Their leading scorer, rebounder, and assister is Arturo Dean in all three categories. Uh, he averages 13.2 points per game. He averages five rebounds per game. I didn't, for some reason, didn't type his assist. I'm sure it's in the 3.0 range assist per game. So, yep, three, yeah. I figured he was around that range, yeah. So, you know, Arturo is, uh, you know, he can be a dangerous player. He's obviously their kind of their their weapon. He's their Kiki Tandy, you know, Jacksonville State, kind of their do-it-all kind of player. Um, you know, slow him down, and you've got a really, really, really good chance of winning the ball game because he obviously is just literally doing everything for him. Now, looking at the team stats, um, WKU is averaging 80 points per game. They're averaging 73.7. We're allowing 73.8. They're allowing 76.3. Field goal percentage, we're shooting 46.7. They're at 43.4. And then rebounds per game, you know, a dominant margin for us, 40.2 for us, 32.3 for them. Um, So just a really, you know, on paper, you know, this looks like a game we should obviously win. We average more. We hold them to less. We shoot better. We rebound a ton more. You know, really one of the factors that this game is going to boil down to is those turnovers and just how aggressive they are on defense. So with that said, let's jump right into keys to victory. Tyler, what's your first key to victory against FIU? Uh, Definitely take care of the ball. They're averaging 13.9 turnovers. 
uh, definitely got to got to win that turnover battle in this game. Uh, if any, I think this could be one of the most important ones to win. Yeah, I know we we've said it a lot. You know, we we said it a lot because we were averaging, you know, eighteen to twenty turnovers early in the season. We weren't valuing the ball. We were efficient scoring the ball, um, but we weren't getting a lot of shots up. You know, teams were regularly getting you know, 10 plus more possessions than us because we were turning the ball over so much. Um, and that kind of performance will be amplified in a game like this against a team that is so aggressive that wants to turn you over. They want to speed you up. They want to pressure you full court and make you make a mistake and then go down and get an easy layup, you know, off your turnover. So definitely I'm right there with you. We have to take care of the ball. We can't turn it over 15 to 18 or plus times. Um, it needs to be down where it has been. In this 10 to 14 range, we can live there. Um, if it's more than that, we're giving them life and we're giving them opportunity to, you know, steal the victory. What's your second key to victory? Uh, I'm I'm just going to throw us out there, dominate the paint. Uh, they have FIU has a center called Seth Pinky Pinkney. Um, he plays 17.4 points or 17.4 minutes a game. Uh, he's only scoring 5.1. I think he scored 11 on us. Uh, he's seven foot one, I think 200 pounds. Um, so, you know, you can't just have them lobbing the ball down to him every time they feel like it. So you're going to have to uh, front him, have some help side defense, maybe. Uh, maybe this could be a game that Bob Carr and Howard get in together. I've seen it maybe one other time this season. Um, but you know, you, you just don't want to get a seven a seven foot one center uh, on the opposing team just free reign over the interior of the paint. I think um, I think dominating the paint is a good one. It might be my third one, but my second one is going to be our three point defense. Um, if I recall correctly, FIU the first time we played them took a high thirties amount of three pointers. I feel like they took was it forty. Yeah, I feel like they took a lot. I remember MTSU took a lot the first time, and FIU took a lot. Um, they're going to shoot a lot of threes. They play a fast style of offense, and with that, they shoot a lot of threes. Um, and a lot of times they're down in ball games. We see that they average less uh, points scored than they allow, so they get behind in games, and then they're shooting threes to try to catch up. We can't allow that to happen. We can't allow them to shoot 35 to 40%. If they do that, shooting that volume – um, it's going to be hard for us to keep up. We're not a great three-point shooting team. We need to be efficient shooting threes if we're shooting 15 to 20. You know, that's kind of where we need to be, you know, hopefully making six to eight of those. Um, but we have to defend them shooting threes. Again, they've got nothing to lose. They're not playing for a one, two, or three seed. They're playing for that play-in eight, nine game uh, going to the conference tournament. So don't let them get hot from three, guard them, uh, make those shots be tough. They're going to shoot them, but we just have to keep a hand up, close that space, and make them be tough shots. Uh, what's your third key to victory? Uh, it's good. It shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, I was originally going to say, you know, uh, let the offense, you know, naturally come to you. But I'm going to say win the offensive battle. Uh, you're right. They're not getting a lot of offense. They're not getting a lot of rebounds, only averaging 32.3. Um and it would be ashamed if we let them somehow uh, out rebound us and get them extra chance, you know, uh, a extra chance to get to get the put back or to get the uh, defensive rebound and hit a uh, hit an outlet pass to a fast running guard, you know, maybe Arturo Dean, uh, and then they go down and get the fast break points. So you know, definitely win the rebounding battle. Yeah, I kind of hinted at my third one earlier. It's going to be, um, you know, feed those big guys down low. I think we can be a mismatch problem against a lot of teams, especially with our two bigs. You know, it's not many teams that are matching up with us in that department. Uh, both of those guys can be effective, can be efficient. Um, and honestly, there there's times I'd like to see both of them out on the court at the same time. I think I've said that a few times. I think I've said that in group chats and or on Twitter. Um, Steve Lutz, if you're listening, throw both of those bigs in there. Let the Twin Towers play to see what happens. I think they're really complimentary. Baba can step out and shoot. Rodney's a, a banger down low. Let's just see what happens. You know, put some, put some, uh, you know, Dante and Don and Brandon around them or Christian. Um, just see what happens. Who knows? But I think we definitely need to feed those guys. 
um, let them be a mismatch and uh, just be efficient. You know, the easiest points are the ones close to the basket. So let those guys eat. Uh, who's going to be your MVT versus uh, FIU? All right, I think this may be the first time I, I said his name all season, which I I think it may be. I'm not for sure. I'm going to say Dante Allen. Uh, you know, he had a 30-piece game against FIU earlier in the season. And, uh, you know, I mean, if they couldn't defend him then, I don't think they'll be able to defend him now. So I'm going to go with him. Uh, Dante Allen is my MVT. I'm looking for lightning in a bottle twice. Dante, another 30-piece, maybe? Question mark? Um, lightning gonna, strikes twice. Yeah, it happens. I'm going to go with Don McHenry, old faithful, uh, old point guard one. I think Don um, – you know, he's our leading scorer for a reason. He's a, a fantastic player. When he's playing aggressive and getting to the hole, um, he's really, really hard to beat. And I think this this pace of a game, we know it's going to be a really fast-paced game, I think, um, is playing to his strength. You know, he's a super quick player, really shifty, twitchy, uh, can get to the goal, can hit that mid-range, can step out. You give him too much room, he, he could pop that three. So I think this – pace of a game really kind of plays into his strength. Um, and obviously we're a fast paced team as well. So it's what we want to do. So I think uh, Don can take advantage of that and lead us to victory and have him a really big game. Uh, what's going to be your score prediction against FIU? I'm going to say we get over a hundred again. Uh, you know, I, I think our offense is going to be fired up, especially, you know, uh, coming off that loss versus MTSU, a good home game versus La Tech is going to have us primed up and ready to go. Uh, gosh, I'm going to go 103, so a, a, f- a few points less since we're playing on the road, 103 to uh, – I'm going to go with 82. Yeah, tops win, 103, 82. Tops win, FIU, you're garbage. Uh, get back in the basement where you belong. And uh, stay there, man. Um, uh, I'm not going as high scoring. Yeah, you know, I think that FIU game was probably one of our best of the season offensively earlier this season. Uh, I'm going to go with a Hilltopper victory pretty comfortably. I'm going to go with 88 to 78. You know, I think the pace of this game is going to lead to a lot of points for both teams. Um, you know, we do give up a lot of points at times. It does happen, but we can also score a lot of points in bunches. So I think – um, give me a 10 point victory, 88, 78. Again, I'm, I'm really excited for this game. Obviously I hate recapping the, uh, MTSU loss that we just had. Um, uh, but there was a lot of, also a lot of good news, uh, between the, you know, track indoor championships, uh, golf had a good, strong, uh, opening tournament, baseball and softball had really good showings this last weekend, um, tennis as well. So, you know, a lot of good stuff going on. Unfortunately, you know, we lost two basketball games to MTSU this last week. Um, it happens. Let's dust ourselves off, get back off, off the mat, and just, you know, how do we respond? That's going to tell me a lot about this team. Um, and then going on the road, you know, we got Louisiana Tech at home, and then we go on the road. We've got FIU, um, and then we don't play again until next Saturday. Uh, we'll preview that game next week uh, as we recap these games. And we have Liberty next Saturday on the 9th of March uh, to close out our regular season. So, you know, we've got to finish strong. You know, none of these final three games are gimmies. You know, we are at 19 wins. We're trying to get to 20. The, you know, Louisiana Tech is obviously going to be a tough match. Then FIU on the road, they're going to want to play spoiler. And then Liberty, you know, they're right there. They're, they're going to want a revenge game. Uh, they're playing better uh, here recently. So, you know, and every Conference USA team is tough to beat on the road. So we, we've got to bring our A game in all these games. Um, Looking forward to obviously seeing you again, be our second basketball game in a row uh, after the MTSU heading down there to Murfreesboro. Um, You know, we've got the pregame Red Towel Trust tailgate to check out. Uh, We'll both be there. Um, Red towels in hand, uh, ready to get some grub, you know, rub some shoulders with some football players, maybe talk about, uh, you know, setting up some interviews for spring. You know, we need to, you know, we need to start getting our, eyes focused and ready for spring football that is right around the corner and uh you know should be a good fun game obviously we're you know we keep thinking hoping that we're going to be close to a sellout you know we've been talking about that 5,000 plus we want more um here it is we're making a strong push for it you know for less than 700 tickets now with uh, under 24 hours to the game 
you know, hopefully the students show out and do their part. And I don't, I don't have any doubt that they will um, with the free concessions uh, voucher that Coach Lutz is offering out there again for the second time this season. Great promotion by him. Um, really love to see that um, investment in our students and trying to reinvigorate them and get them back out. Just real excited for this week and this game. Um, and it should be a fun one. I can't wait to you know recap a couple of victories uh, when we convene next. So, Tyler, hit us with your final words and take us the heck out of here. Good Lord willing, there's going to be two victories coming up this week. Uh, you know, I like as, as you said, I, I'm excited to be there to see this uh, last game of the season. Hopefully, a lot of the fans will be there. A lot of people dressed in uh, in their uh, black attire will be there to support the Hilltoppers because this team deserves it. Don't let uh, this previous weekend's game affect your judgment on whether you want to stay or go to this game. Definitely come out, show out, support the team, be loud, be be rouch, uh, be a uh, be a uh, ruckus to La Tech uh, because this team does deserve it. You know these students; they don't know how good they got it. You know, whenever I was a student, we had Ray Harper set out there, or Ray Harper come out after the last home game of the season and uh, give us a little speech, which I'm not mad at. It was good. It got us fired up for conference tournament. Uh, I didn't get no free food out of the deal, though. You know, I was there through the good times and the bad times. I never got no free food out of it. And as a college student, that's, you know, uh, food, drinks for free. Hell yeah, sign me up. Uh, but I, I seriously do hope these students show up because, you know, really that's what college athletics is all about. The students coming there, being loud, being annoying to, to the other team, supporting their team. Uh, so hopefully this place, the place will be rocking and rolling like I know it can, can do. Um, you know, also Red Tower wrap up was great. Uh, I hated that we lost to the uh, big blue putty cats, uh, but you know that happens from time to time. Uh, Louisville Cardinals, you're still garbage. Uh, we'll we'll get you next time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, go tops. Woke up Sunday morning a little a little hurt, but you know it's always a good day to wake up as a Hilltopper fan. So with that, I'll say moth. Who has it better than us? Nobody, buddy. You always know it. You know. Go Tops. Go Tops, guys. Later. See you. Welcome to Topper Talk, your number one Western Kentucky Athletics podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Moffitt, and I'm joined by co-host Tyler Bailey. Hilltopper Nation, whether it's happening on the hill or on the road, grab those red towels.